There are uh, three active planning processes going on in um, Mountain View at the uh, San Antonio area, um, in Sunnyvale at the uh, Lawrence Station area, and uh, here uh, San Jose only a mile and small change away at Deridon. And in all of these areas, cities are thinking about um, doing some major transformation of the neighborhoods around the Caltrain station. And this interacts with the Caltrain modernization, especially um, so for Mountain View and Sunnyvale, uh, Lawrence, the, those are that stations that right now have really, really bad service. And so if you think about, well, how does and should development around the station area take advantage of the transit? You know, if you have bad service, you know, a lot of people are going to drive anyway. But if you think you're going to get a lot more train service, that adds additional options into how you think about the land use around that station. Um, and uh, Deardon, as I think we'll hear from our folks here, it already has. Uh, good service because it gets um, all the trains uh, that Caltrain runs, but Deerdon is going to be an even more major transit hub with uh, BART coming through <coughs> and Amtrak trains and, and other improvements. So its role as a transit hub is going to improve and increase, and that creates some new options. Um, so uh, what I'll do is um, ask uh, uh, each panelist, uh, you know, who, who they are, what they're doing, and then um, some questions about, in each city, what it is that they're doing to plan that station area and how and whether it's taking advantage of that, that uh, transit in terms of what the land uses are, and then, well, how do you get to the transit? How, how, does, um, how would you actually get to the train? My name is Jared Mullen. Uh, I live in Mountain View, and I'm also a volunteer with the uh, Mountain View Coalition for Sustainable Planning, which is a small grassroots uh, organization in Mountain View dedicated to uh, sustainable transportation and land use planning, uh, uh, advocating for sustainable transportation and land use uh, planning in the city, uh, and also regional decisions that impact the city as well. Uh, and one of the projects that we're working on uh, advocacy-wise is the uh, San Antonio Area Precise Plan, which is a new uh, district neighborhood level plan that the city of Mountain View has just embarked on uh, for, the, uh, for the area, for the land around the San Antonio Caltrain Station. And uh, if you're not familiar with the area, uh, there's downtown Mountain View, Castro Street, I think a lot of people probably know about uh, Castro Street in downtown Mountain View. Uh, well, San Antonio is uh, just the next stop towards Palo Alto on Caltrain. Uh, it's, it's about two miles from downtown Mountain View. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting area. It's, it has a lot of potential uh, to really leverage that transit investment around there. Uh, okay. And uh, so why is the city and, and the community, why are people paying attention to San Antonio at this time? Why, why San Antonio? Why now? Well, the city of Mountain View, much like San Jose, just completed a general plan update. Uh, so I know a lot of people from San Jose here may be familiar with the, uh, the Envision 2040 general plan that San Jose just completed. Well, Mountain View just completed their general plan 2030 uh, just a year ago, I believe. And in the general plan, they identified some key change areas, much like the urban village concept that San Jose has. Uh, where the land uses uh, are, are targeted to change over time, at likely add some density, a mix of uses around major transit lines. And one of those areas in Mountain View is the San Antonio area. Because the San Antonio area uh, is really bracketed by uh, El Camino Real, which has very frequent bus service. It's part of VTA's new BRT program. Uh, and it's also bracketed by the Caltrain, uh, Caltrain line. Uh, these two corridors are less than a mile apart. Uh, so you have two conduits of very frequent, uh, fast uh, transit service that's, tar that's only going to improve. So the city is really interested in looking at how the land use in this area can support the transit service and the transit service can support the land use changes. Uh, and there's tremendous opportunity here because the existing land uses in this area are uh, very low density, uh, a lot of surface parking, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of buildings that are showing their age. Okay. 
Um, okay, so we've got this, um, you know, mid uh, 20th century uh, retail store surrounded by uh, lots of parking and uh, maybe uh, queued up for some change. And um, so what has uh, Mountain View done to really uh, kick off this uh, planning process and uh, what, what's come out of that? Like what, what, is, uh, what is the community saying that they want to see out of this uh, sea of parking? <laughs> Well, the, the city of Mountain View uh, was originally not planning to do a precise plan for this area uh, for quite a while. Uh, there were other plans in the pipeline ahead of this one, uh, but the area came under a lot of development pressure. There was a lot of development interest for the area. Uh, the area is over 60 acres, approaching 60, 70 acres of these underutilized surface parking lots, dilapidated shopping centers and strip malls, and uh, Given its location near Palo Alto and Los Altos and the transit, the, the land value has been increasing a lot. So there's a lot of developer interest. And given the developer interest to build uh, and the new general plan that Mountain View just enacted, which allows um, it's changing the zoning to allow up to eight-story uh, mixed-use development in this area, uh, there could be a lot of potential impacts uh, given the developer interest, but a lot of opportunities as well to provide new public services, new open spaces, better streets. Uh, and the resident interest, including the coalition's interest, has been to really ensure that this neighborhood develops properly and becomes a really great village center, really a great place to be. Uh, and recognizing that the city of Mountain View started a, uh, after a resident comment and input to council, they started a visioning process. Uh, had two visioning meetings to identify some of the opportunities. And it's really interesting that one of the key ideas from this visioning meeting was the idea of creating great streets, main streets, was the term that really came out of the, the process. No, no fortress-like development with walls around all the public streets. No, people wanted uh, you know, retail, sidewalk cafes, um, you know, street trees, uh, excellent bicycle and pedestrian connections. There was definitely some disagreement about how tall these buildings should be. Um, but one thing people really rallied around was great public spaces, great streets, uh, and we need to move that forward. Okay. Um, great. And um, I, I was uh, uh, at uh, some of these meetings, and it was really interesting that so many people came out and they said, you know, gee, this is, um, you know, really good for driving, but not really good for getting around um, biking and walking, and it's hard to get to and from the train station, and that was something that people uh, really clearly wanted, and so that's actually one thing um, that uh, uh, maybe is uh, relevant to some of the other areas as well, um, which is um, if, you know, p people who are using transit need to be able to get to and from biking and walking, or people just want to be able to get around biking and walking in addition to driving. Uh, so, uh, Jared, what's going to happen next um, for San Antonio? And uh, uh, this is this is actually kind of interesting. It's it's a little it's a little different and a little strange. So, so what's about to happen next? Well, like I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of development pressure in the area um, to redevelop, and uh, the city, in my opinion, jumped the gun a bit and uh, a land, a la, a granted one developer uh, uh, entitlements to build uh, under the proposed general plan guidelines before the general plan was even approved. So the developer said, ah, yeah, you know, trust us, just trust us. We're, we're building um, this to your general plan specifications. Just let us build it before the plan is approved. And city council allowed it, shockingly. Uh, and um, so... It's, it's challenging because you're building a neighborhood on the scale of 50 to 60 acres, if not more, uh, that's going to totally transform to much higher density land uses. You have all this potential for public space, great uh, transportation investments, uh, but how are we going to leverage that? How are we going to make it really great without a plan? You wouldn't build a new house without a plan. You you do the designs, you look at how your house is going to be built, and then you build it. You don't just uh, buy some wood and start building a two-story house and it'll be fine. No, you, you don't do that. So 
So why are we building a whole neighborhood without a plan? And this is the challenge um, that city council will be facing in March, where they're basically going to be deciding, should we allow all these development proposals to proceed in parallel with the planning process, where the policies won't be solidified in the plan? Or should we do the plan first, and then allow people to build? And so this will be the big question. Uh, personally, um, I hope that they plan first before allowing uh, massive development on a kind of haphazard scale and jump headlong into the, uh, the future. Um, but we shall see in, uh, in March. Hi, I'm Barbara Fukumoto. I'm a member of Sunnyvale Cool, which is a local group. <coughs> um, our, our, we, we were formed in 2007, uh, seated by the Sierra Club, and our, our main mission is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We noticed early on that um, land use planning and transportation planning has a huge impact on our on our um, city's greenhouse gas emissions. And we also noticed that a lot of planning was going on. Um, the city was redoing, re doing, revising its general plan, <clears throat> the guts of its general plan, the land use and transportation element. And also developing a long range, range plan for Lawrence Station. Lawrence is the second Caltrain station in Sunnyvale. Our first is downtown. And our second is Lawrence Station, which um, is right up on Lawrence Expressway, right off Lawrence Expressway along the tracks. <clears throat> right now, Lawrence is um, kind of a hodgepodge of uses. Uh, it's kind of divided into four quadrants. One quadrant has Costco. Uh, another cost quadrant has a rather new multifamily development. That part is in Santa Clara. Um, the third quadrant uh, uh, is a lot of commercial kind of one-story tilt-up buildings. And the fourth qu quadrant is, uh, well, it's a, a big landscape materials depot right along the tracks. And then across the street is some, some, town, some townhouses and, <coughs> and various small businesses. And uh, it's... Uh, <clears throat> Let's say it's not a cohesive neighborhood. Um, the site, the blocks are long. The the sidewalks, if they're there at all, come to sudden stops. It's not a safe place to bike or walk, and there's really no center to the um, to the area. So. Um, Okay, so, so that uh, very much describes what it's like now, and um, I uh, came out on a tour of the Lawrence Station area plan that um, Barbara helped to organize, and one of the things that I noticed while I was out there is um, almost everywhere that you are within a quarter of a mile from the station, you can be a quarter of a mile as the crow flies, but it probably takes a half a mile or more to walk there. Um, so if you are... Uh, let's see, um, so if you're on the other side of Reed Avenue and you live there and you're trying to get to the Caltrain station, there's no crosswalk on the street. You have to walk all the way down to cross at a light, um, cross at a light, walk all the way over, and it's about a half a <coughs> mile. Same thing, if you're in um, one of these office buildings and you think you might want to go to the train station, which is a quarter of a mile away, um, you have to go... Uh, all the way around to get there, and, and that's one of the challenges. So how, um, so uh, what has, what's been done so far, and what's come out of, um, uh, what do people think that they might want to do with the Lawrence area to transform it from this kind of hodgepodge that uh, is difficult to get around? And uh, uh, one other thing about that, um, to, uh, be aware of here <clears throat> is that San Antonio and Sunnyvale Lawrence are among the <clears throat> lowest ridership stations. So with these very car centric designs that are hard to get around in low density, you see really low ridership compared to the top stations, Fort Thinking, Palo Alto, Mountain View, and Deer Don. So what are um, what do folks uh, think that they might want to have happen at Lawrence? Well the city <clears throat> um, convened a citizens advisory group 
to work with city staff um, on developing a plan there. And it's, it's kind of a diverse group, and they've been working on it the better part of a year. And they've come forward with a plan that would increase the density around the station. Um, it would be mixed use, commercial, residential, retail, um, <clears throat> especially dense right near the tracks within a quarter mile. It, it, the plan would also improve the cir circulation um, through the area, make better connections, street connections, uh, bike trail um, on the East Channel, um, which is our draining di drainage ditch. Um, yeah, so that proposal is going to, um, and, and our group has, has tried to facilitate um, the public learning about the process. We hosted a tour of the area. We hosted um, the community services, or community development director um, describing the plan that the advisory committee has come up with. And then we're trying to keep people aware of the decision points that are coming up. Well, one is coming up on Tuesday, and the plan goes to council. And we're not at all sure how that uh, vote will go. There are council members that don't want to see any population growth or any density um, <clears throat> in Sunnyvale. Uh, so we're not sure that the plan for denser mixed use will be approved. They'll probably approve the approved, improved circulation and the complete streets and the public space that's been planned but as to whether they'll approve more housing and uh, taller buildings uh, remains to be seen. Hi, I'm Helen Chapman. I'm a director with the Shasta Hanjik Park Neighborhood Association. And my involvement, yes, I am the Neighborhood Association that encompasses, yes, that encompasses this plan and directly affected. Um, the interesting part is our Neighborhood Association was actually formed because of the um, HP Pavilion, or what was known as the arena back then, uh, we were concerned about the, the placement of parking and the impact it would have on the, the neighborhood. And we were instrumental in getting formed a traffic management plan, which is now still currently in effect today. So we, we take full credit. You may not hear about that from the bureaucrats within San Jose, but we, that, that's where we came from. Um, Back in 2007, 2008, I believe there was talk about a uh, baseball stadium coming to this area. Carlos, down there. Yep. Uh, so there, they were formed a Dear Don Good Neighbor Committee, which I was a part of. Uh, still a part of, the, though the committee is not meeting as frequently as it did. Uh, what was interesting about that process is the Deer Dunga Neighbor Committee was formed over how baseball was going to in, um, uh, affect land use planning in the area, but it actually turned and it became about the priority of the Deer Dunga Station itself and the transportation hub that was going to transform the planning around this area. And it brought in a large coalition of different um, speakers and um, community folks from various different walks of life and it was it was very good very good process and uh, good vision that came out of it simultaneously the city of San Jose was also embarking on its general plan 2040 and a subset of that was a deer on station area plan by the, the city planning department that were going on all simultaneously there was a lot of, I'm listening to the other two speakers and I'm thinking yeah been there yeah yeah um, in our Concerns, we also, you know, have the concerns about the density and development first, regards to planning first. So I, I'm in full agreement of some of the things that you've said. The other plan that's not mentioned but we are a part of is the Alameda, A Beautiful Way, which is the major street, which is the tail end of the Grand Boulevard initiative, which many of you probably know about that coming through the cities from San Francisco all the way down. That one is actually very exciting because that process is a community-led process which is now starting implementation this summer. Um, that's uh, exciting to uh, learn about because um, just like the different station areas face common concerns and opportunities, um, there's uh, so similarly along uh, El Camino area <coughs> and Ground Boulevard. Um, so, so Carlos, um, can you describe what uh, your involvement has been and also uh, add uh, some 
uh, thoughts about the what vision has emerged um, for the Derrida Station area? Sure. Uh, my name is Carlos Babcock. Um, I've actually been uh, on Caltrain committees with Adina. I'm currently I'm chair of the San Jose Bike and Pedestrian uh, Committee, and right now I'm working on our second annual um, National Train Day at Deardon Station, which we now have uh, support from the Mineta Transportation Institute and some others. We celebrate the impact of trains and what it can do to our neighborhoods. Uh, my involvement at the time was working with the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition and trying to create better access for actually pedestrians and cyclists to the area. Um, if I can point out here, I, some, you know, where you showed the mountain view and you said that it was centered around the train station. Well, San Jose used to be because the train lines ran right through here, but in, I believe it was 1938, they actually moved, they realigned all the train tracks, built the station, um, actually was renovated a, few, um, a decade or so ago, but these are all relatively new tracks. But now if you look at San Jose, this downtown area is bifurcated by a major freeway the confluence of two, uh, two creeks into the uh, Guadalupe River, railroad tracks, uh, what I call not a wall, but a curtain of arrivals to San Jose Airport. And when you look at that, it really creates connectivity issues for anyone but in a car. And actually they're working on, uh, this is Autumn Street, they're working on connecting this to Coleman, which is a major arterial that will feed traffic from the arena and possibly ballpark two freeways. So when you look at the area, it poses huge constraints for cyclists and pedestrians um, because one, there's only two major um, throughputs to get under the freeway and again you've got the river. Um, so the involvement was to see how we could make downtown connect to that area. And the city right now has done some great things downtown mm -hmm. um, and with a bike share, which Mountain View will also get but that will hopefully connect cyclists to the train station because right now it's very difficult, even if you wanted to walk to downtown, very few people get off at the station and walk to downtown. There is a shuttle, um, uh, the dash shuttle, but it's pretty prohibitive, so. Yeah, and that, that's, a, um, the, uh, that's a common thread in, in San Jose and in, in Lawrence where um, their safety problems in walking to the train station, but also if something is you know really ugly and, and bleak, that's also uh, a problem. Uh, studies show that if um, you know people are willing to walk further when the walking is actually pleasant, when there's interesting things to look at. So if there's a big wall, if there's a you know if it's by a, a highway, an underpass, um, you know, or a big area of dirt with trash, people will walk less far than if it's buildings with storefronts and lamp posts and trees and other interesting things to, to look at. Um, so, um, so you've been doing the work on improving the connectivity to the station. Um, one thing that um, has come up in uh, uh, Lawrence and in, in Mountain View as well, is um, that with car centric development, you have really a big, a uh, lot of space used for parking. And, uh, you know, in a typical American uh, suburban development pattern, um, the amount of parking is actually as much or more as the amount of space used for buildings. Um, so, um, how are those decisions being looked at? in San Jose, and um, uh, are, are there any open questions in terms of how to handle parking? Mm -hmm. um, I guess Car Car uh, Carlos and then Helen. Okay. Well, you know, it's funny about San Jose because the first time I went to the San Jose Downtown Association website, it said, come to downtown San Jose. We have 25,000 parking spaces. And I just, coming from San Diego, that's not how we always got people to come to our city. But if you look, a huge amount of wasted space that when we talk about sustainability, it pays no taxes, no property taxes, no sales taxes, and not just in parking but in freeways. And I know in the transportation uh, management plan for HP Pavilion, um, you had a city that was desperate to get something down uh, in that area. And so you had a plan that called for so many parking spaces within a third of a mile and then in that space within a half of a mile. 
And believe me, parking is a right. huge thing down in San Jose. If you've ever been to a downtown parking association meeting, mm -hmm. I sit on the, I right. chair the Bike Medicine Advisory Committee, very casual, very low key. There were more suits, or if you go to, there's more suits from City Hall on one end of the table and we have a, on our whole bike committee. So you usually have 10 people represented from the downtown. And the reason why is because they're paying huge amounts of debt service on parking garages. So it not only costs the city in terms of money, but like you say, land space that isn't productive use of land. So it's a huge piece of, of property for San Jose, but the question is, again, in this parking problem. Um, 50% of people who go to AT&T Park, a 41,000 seat stadium, arrive by non-auto uses. Um, rail uses for the arena, it's about 3%. So there's a huge difference. Um, uh, and um, I, I think, uh, Helen, what, uh, what do you have to add on, on this parking? Well, there's, there's, there's one major player, which is a, which is a uh, I would say it's something to watch for and it's something to um, to help leverage is that HP Pavilion is it's, it's almost its own entity. It's not necessarily in line with the current views of the city officials and the general plan and some of the great streets and improvements. In fact, it was kind of interesting that within the gen uh, Good Neighbor Committee you know, we had suggested, well, is there any way that we can get <coughs> more bicycle parking and, and less cars coming in? And they've actually bought a piece of property there where they're going to put in another parking garage right over here. here. So they're adding parking at the <coughs> same time. You have kind of a yin and yang going on right now where we want to see less of that because we know that if you think <coughs> the parking is too expensive over at H Pavilion, they're gonna, the overflow is going to park into the neighborhood. And we, with the loss of redevelopment agency, some of the parking spaces, that parking lots that we had along the Alameda are now being locked off and going back to the private owner. So it's creating a perfect storm of an issue. So this is something that we need assistance with, is creating that momentum uh, for a more walkable and um, pedestrian-oriented experience. You know, if you mentioned the first and last mile. That is, it's critical. If you've ever come from the Alameda into uh, to that area, walking that underpass is very scary, and it's not something a female, you know, would want to do or a family would want to do, um, and so we need to work on, on that. Um, I'll ask you a question about that in a second, but first I want to do a little bit of uh, compare and contrast um, because um, so in so with the um, HP Pavilion. Do they, uh, so I know they know how many people drive versus how many people take, take transit, and it's a lot lower than that 50% at AT&T Park. Do they know where people uh, live? And um, I'll, I'll give you the example. So in Mountain View, um, they're uh, dealing with um, how to get people to the area where Google is in North Bayshore. And what they do is they um, analyze um, out of people coming in and going out, where do they live? Where are they coming from? And then is their only choice going to be to drive? Can there be carpools? Can they take transit? Can they take shuttle? Can they bike and they walk? So they analyze what people's choices are and then work to beef up those choices. Um, so for the HP uh, Pavilion, have they even done this analysis yet? I highly doubt it. Okay. Yes, that was one of the recommendations of the Good Neighbor Committee was to increase the transit use for people going to the pavilion and to offer alternate uses, which to have bike parking, even charge for it. I think people would like a safe place to put their bicycle. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, questions? Um, Caltrain, I think, um, <clears throat> so I'll get too, too deep into it, at least uh, yeah. on this topic. Caltrain is largely in my opinion, built for commuters. It's not built for the evening service. It's not built for arena. Um, AT&T Park, I think it's, it, it's, you have to be careful comparing numbers because you don't have an option. There, are, there is no real parking down there. So you're better off parking. A lot of people drive up and take it just one or two stations in because it's more convenient because um, they cannot park. San Jose, you can park. So nobody takes the train. Why does nobody take the train? Mm -hmm. Because the ticket prices are through the roof. The reason that you have a lot of ridership, mm -hmm. it's not people paying out of their pockets. 
it's largely the corporations subsidizing those on the weekdays. Right. And you, you, if you crack those numbers down, you'll see after that window, not very many people ride on the weekends right. or in the evenings, mm -hmm. particularly if you're taking a family to to well, a bank. Yes and no. Um, as Helen was saying, they don't know where they come from. There has been no push. The, pu the, the numbers that you see for parking, there's never any goals for transit usage right. at, at the arena. If you look at AT&T Park, they have, if you order season tickets, you can get transit passes. They have what's called transit ambassadors. They have uh, printed and online materials to help you use transit. So there is a not only a marketing push, but a push to get to their goals, whereas I haven't seen anything like that in San Jose. So, yeah, it, that's true, but also there is no, there's, there's no incentive or there's, a, you know, well, another thing too is you have huge Caltrans parking lots right across the street, and so what they're trying to do in their plan is to coordinate which commuters leave during the day, and then how can we supplement our income by parking cars for the stadium that, or the sports arena at night. So, yeah, it's, it's, it is a different environment. But there's no real push to to achieve those goals. Right. right. There, there isn't anything really inherent about Caltrain for why it runs um, its service pattern um, versus BART. So BART will run, you know, 20 minutes into the night and 20 minutes on the weekend. And it's not because BART's technology is different, uh, or it, it it it's it, it's you know partly it's money, and then partly once Caltrain is electric. Its finances will look even more like BART, and running bike like service is going to get even. It's going to get more practical. Um, so I, it's I don't not think electrification is going to change the finances significantly <coughs> that way. Um, <coughs> but and, and some of it's a policy decision. So it's not. So we tend to think of Caltrain and BART as completely different animals. And some of that, you know, it, it's not so much that it's a different animal. It's what we expect out of it, and do we actually want, do we think our area needs that kind of transit service where you can, you know, run at night and during the day and stop at all the stations, or do we want it to be more of a commuter rail where you go in the morning, you go at night, and then, you know, you don't use the service at other times. It's, it's a policy decision in the community. The other problem with, yeah. and to Joe's point, Mm -hmm. is that San Jose is a bedroom community. We have more people in our city at night than we do during the day mm -hmm. because we are housing rich and job poor. So people are exiting San Jose to the other cities mm -hmm. and we are not. And that's causing part of our financial stress. There is no funding. You know, Carlos mentioned about the Autumn Street Parkway. There is no funding now to continue that expansion that was uh, leveraged on the redevelopment agency. There's also work to try and um, unearth the Guadalupe River trail system, what some people call free the creek, so that that allows for a better system of experience going and using that existing trail system. That again has no has no funding. What does have funding Igor, is, is the Alameda because we were able to get, and that did not leverage on redevelopment money, we able to leverage that on federal money uh, for redoing the road and from an MTC grant, which the community helped work. So I think there are ways that can be done, because we've done it in our neighborhood. We just need to help push the city to look for those additional ways. And there's actually another trend um, that I think um, a Mountain View is looking to do that may be relevant here as well. So when you talk about um, with Caltrain, it's the big companies that subsidize the ridership for their riders. Partly, actually, because parking is really expensive for a big company to provide. They know how much money they spend for that land, and they would rather spend it on the transit pass instead. But um, to buy into that uh, deep discount transit pass program, the minimum is uh, 13500 mm -hmm. So if you're a, that's the minimum cost to buy into Go Pass if you're a company. So if you are a, a small business um, on Alameda, or if you are a startup company in Mountain View, you can't afford to buy into GoPass. But um, what uh, some more and more cities are looking into is doing something called a Transportation Management Association, where smaller businesses can buy in 
and get the transit passes for the um, whole area for you know multiple startup companies or businesses or even um, housing developments. And um, then you do wind up improving the economics for transit um, for uh, more, more people and not just the big companies. Okay. I was just wondering how the neighborhood feels about the neighborhood that you represent up over creating this kind of station area plan as in like an entertainment district like with bars and a lot of restaurants because I think for this station specifically to be successful you have it needs to be an entertainment district where people go out you know drinking after the games and people a destination spot so I was just wondering if that was welcomed by the neighborhood like <coughs> you know it's probably going to be a little bit rowdier you know but I was just wondering. um well, in case you guys haven't heard, to us it's very exciting news is that Whole Foods is finally moving forward. So we're going to have an anchor grocery store right on the corner. And one of the things that they are putting in it is a brew pub. So I think that's going to give us a kickstart right, right away to that, that vision. So that one, that's something that we're looking forward to. That stalled since 2008 as well. So there's... We're getting to be very patient as a neighborhood on, you know, continually saying, this is what we want, this is what we want. Um, one of the interesting things, too, is Whole Foods, the first design that came back, didn't have that interface with the street that we wanted, and we pushed back and did quite a lobbying campaign, and they've, they've improved their design. So, yeah, we're, we're a very pers persistent neighborhood. We're looking to see that the, the job potential is increased around this transit area, whether it's use of restaurants or entertainment or even, you know, even businesses coming in, large businesses, where we can start pulling in because we need to have that job base in order to provide the services or we can't continue to have more housing and house everybody because we can't afford to improve the streets. If you ever driven down the Alameda, the potholes are pretty bad. Can you answer this question also? Um, Helen and I go back when I was on the Bureau of uh, uh, Committee as well, also on San Jose General Plan Update Task Force. And it depends on where you live. The people who were right behind, like a brew pub, might not like it, and they would complain and meet in community meetings. But in general, most of the neighbors who weren't directly behind something wanted the increase. Um. Also, the plan is not just that one area at the station, it's three areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the northernmost is meant to be an attracting to businesses and startups. The middle one is the kind of that entertainment yeah. concept adjacent to the station, adjacent to the ballpark. Um, the neighborhood that is on the other side, the east side, they are embracing redevelopment and the high density, and uh, this is Delmas Park, mm -hmm. and they've really got sought out um, help for that to get jump start and work with developers. So, but they, the thing is, there we talk about the lack of connectivity. Well, in a way, that takes care of some of the issues that go with party centers. Um, you, you don't have drunks stumbling all over because we got a railroad track and a creek that blocks them and funnels them down specific streets. So to that extent, it becomes policeable instead of everybody stumbling all over in all different directions. So it's a pretty contained little district. Good comment on the uh, commercial, too. And if I could just make one comment. In the plan, if I recall, this whole area, the all three zones total, will be about 400, you know, 10 year plus build out or whatever, about 424,000. In commercial retail, just to put that in perspective, I believe this shopping center up here, which is a very car oriented, although the city believes it's downtown, <laughs> it's very car oriented. I believe that's 320,000. Leaving more in perspective, the plant is something like uh, this other uh, shopping about 520,000 or so square feet of retail, mm -hmm. and the newly announced Almaded Ranch down to the south is 350,000. So it's a small dent compared to all these suburban. Uh, hubs of Targets and Panda Expresses and Paneras that seem to just pop up like weeds after a rainstorm in San Jose. Yeah. So, and that's going to take 10 years to build where these are usually two, you know, two years or so, and then boom, they're in your neighborhood. 
Um, but to your point, I think having that integration of the public space, I'm a huge park advocate. I didn't even get into that side of my... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm doing the neighborhood part. But having that integration of public space, access, with the vibrancy of the transit center and the employment uses and the and the retail is going to make it a really great place but we have to make sure that you get all those pieces coexisting <coughs> together and the, the, the common thread here is that in each city it's um, people getting involved in those local decision making processes and um, you know to, to try and get the neighborhood to be uh, the way that you want it to be. So if you have uh, signed up, if you're in one of the cities represented, um, you'll, uh, you may also hear from Barbara or uh, Jared or the, the San Jose folks. And if you're interested in keeping up to date on things relating to Caltrain and Caltrain modernization, because it's people getting involved that will make it more what we want to be. So thank you. Adina? Yes. I neglected to mention that we partnered with the Sustainable Land Use on the Sierra Club, and they've applied their station guidelines to mm -hmm. our station area and written letters in. But I think these guidelines apply to other station areas too, and I've made copies if you're um, if you're interested in these Great. the letters um, about the station area and plan guidelines. Okay, thanks, and uh, uh, feel free to hear if, uh, any any uh, more questions. Um, you can talk to me after or at lunch, or mm -hmm. any of the panelists who uh, have been so instrumental in each of their neighborhoods. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.